when I was um, when I was undergraduate student taking the same course that you are taking now, the TA, the, the structure of the course was we had uh, a professor lecturing once a week and then twice a week we went with the TA which was a, who was a graduate student to practice and turn in the homework and receive the graded homework. So um, so he gave us this, uh, this integral. Um, Tell us, go ahead and evaluate the integral uh, e to the x squared dx. And I don't know about you guys, but some people, and I know that some of you are here, uh, if you have a problem that uh, appeared to be solvable and cannot, you cannot solve it, then you cannot lay off. You cannot let up. You cannot go to bed. You cannot eat. You can do, cannot do some other... Uh, you cannot socialize, you're preoccupied. And we were, I was, some other people in my course, were doing this, internet was not exi did not exist at the time. And if we took it as a, as a personal uh, challenge. I mean, what do you mean we should be able to do so? We have so many tools, uh, we know integration, we, we learn so many integration techniques. This looked to be simple enough. Right? Jake, did you ask me about that? Okay, so can do it. Took me four days to realize that no, whatever I do, I cannot do it. Then we came back and the TA said, Well, yeah, this is not a solvable problem. Not analytically. <laughs> so but it was good a review of all the trick technique, all the integration technique that we learned. Because we try every every little bit, so cannot be evaluated uh, analytically or using um, any uh, one of um, the previously learned technique. So, and let's make it a zero to one. Let, let's make it a definite integral. Another case which is more close to reality, uh, hopefully many of you will become, will become an engineer and, and, uh, or continue to, to work in either science or engineering. A lot of time we receive data stream, and the data stream uh, need to be uh, integrated in one form or another. Uh, so you don't have even a function that you need to integrate. Now, the, a lot of time you need to do some, you need to process information in real time. And a, an example would be, for instance, if you are getting constant data from, uh, well, in this case, it will be a, a missile, say a guided missile uh, ground, to, ground to air. Uh, and, and you need to continue uh, to give it a constant feedback uh, as part of a automatic control system. So you need to process data in real time, whether it will be integration, differentiation, or any other kind of calculation. Um, and so you need to, you cannot stop and now uh, apply some kind of regression or other modeling techniques to come up with a function that model the acceleration or the velocity or the position of, of something like that. You need to look at the data and process it as quickly as possible, and that's where we're going to do integration uh, by approximation or numerical integration, which the next topic. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we're going to start with uh, basic stuff. The first um, thing that we learn when we learn how to integrate, uh, we pretty much develop Riemann sum, if you recall, and we look at that left hand sum and right hand sum. Uh, um, in technique to evaluate the area captured between a graph of function and the x-axis. So if we have uh, some kind of curve, and this is the curve of y equal f of x, and we want to evaluate it, say, from um, a to b on the x-axis. So 
this will be A, and let's say this will be B. So those are the boundaries. And we know that the integral will be the area captured right here. Um, well, one of the things that we can do is start dividing. And we can divide to 3 or or 10 or 1,000, and we learn that the more we divide, the better estimate we have. Okay, So here's what we learn. Uh, well, actually, by definition, what is the uh, the integral, the definite integral? By definition, the definite integral is the limit of Riemann sum. So let's recall uh, the definition uh, of of um, the definite integral. So what Riemann said is, if we pick up. We have three subintervals in this case. Okay, the width of each interval, assuming that they are equally spaced, will be delta x. So each subinterval is delta x, like so. And uh, delta x is d b minus a divided by, in this case, it would be 3. Okay, in general case, it would be divided by n. Okay. Now, Riemann said if we pick up a value in each interval, not necessarily uh, the left hand point or the right hand point or even in the in the center, it can be anywhere inside this interval. So let's say this will be interval number one, this will be interval number two, and this will be interval number three. So we'll call this value of x x sub one star. With this value of x will be x sub two star and this value of x will be x sub 3 star, okay? So, and <clears throat> right here at the intersection between the value of x and the curve, see the value of y, the corresponding value of y. So this will be f of x sub 1 star, and right here we have f of x sub 2 star, oops, the parentheses will be right here, and likewise, right here we have uh, f of x sub 3 star. And imagine that we have n subintervals like this, so by definition, the integral from a to b of f of x dx will be the limit as we take the number of subintervals to infinity. And now we're going to add, and we're going to add, it will be sigma, the sum, uh, and we go from 1 to n of all the value of x sub i, the index, star. In other words, this is a value inside the interval times the width of the interval, delta x. So what happens if we let n goes to infinity? First of all, delta x becomes dx as it becomes very small. and what about x star, x sub i star? Do we really care where in an interval that is, is whose width is close to zero, where we position that value? It doesn't matter. The interval is so small that as long as we position x inside this inter interval or at the end point, it makes absolutely no difference. So this is the definition. Okay. <clears throat> now, of course, we learn how to calculate the integral using all kind of integration technique, but also one of the outcome is the ability to approximate. And matter of fact, when we learn integration, we start by approximating the area. And by creating, uh, initially, we created rectangles. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at, um, at left and sum. <clears throat> right in sum and midpoint.
If you recall, in Calc 1, we gave, his, we gave those approximation, uh, L sub, the, uh, the notation L sub n, R sub n, and M sub n for left, right, and midpoint rule. And if you look at uh, the curve, This time I'll go uh, with 2, and I say, okay, this is x sub i, just ra a random. It doesn't mean that I divide it only by 2. I, I, I have many subintervals like this, but I'm looking at a 2 subinterval center at x sub i. So to the left, you have x sub i minus 1, and to the right, you have x sub i plus 1, okay? And here I'm going to use uh, colors. So the left hand sum will be the value of this rectangle and this rectangle. Okay? So remember, this value, the y value here, is f of x sub i. I'm sorry, f of x sub i minus 1. The value here is f of x sub i, and the value here at the right end point of the second interval will be f of x sub i plus 1. So what is the area in blue? Well, that will give us the left hand sum. It will be for this particular interval, it will be uh, x sub f of x sub i minus 1 plus f of x sub i times the delta x. Delta x remains the same. It's the difference between these two. So you have delta x and delta x. So in general, we can say that uh, we have delta x times sigma, I mean, I can put it at the end, actually I ought to put it at the end, in case it's not equally spaced. See, that's, that's the assumption that the intervals are equally spaced can be a false assumption. A assumption. Especially if you collect real life data uh, at times, the data won't come to you at equally spacey intervals. A lot of time, we trigger the data collection. We have some kind of uh, uh, a receiver that generates a, a, a pulse that tells the transmitter, okay, send me your data. And it, it happened very quickly. Um, but at times, we have passive devices and we depend on how when the transmitter sent us the, Ben, I can tell you some project I was involved in. Um, we, we, we looked into this, uh, how can we guarantee that we have equally spaced signals so we don't have to worry about different value of delta x. So sometimes, you know, you think it's guaranteed, but it's not. All right, so here we go, what do we have? We have sigma, and since we go from one to n. Okay, but what is the first value? As you can see, we're going to start with, uh, we're going to go 1, i minus 1. And the last one, if this will be n to the right, we're going to end up at n minus 1. So we go sigma from i equals 1 to n, but the x value, the uh, notation, the subscript for the x value will be x minus 1, uh, i minus 1 times delta x. So this is the uh, left-hand sum. Again, this is something you all learned in the previous course. And so is the next. If we want to evaluate the same area, but this time taking the value at each endpoint of the interval, notice that 
for these two, we're going to calculate the value at x sub i and x sub i plus 1. So, r sub n will be sigma from 1 to n of f of x sub i this time, delta x. How these two compare to the actual value? Well, at least in this particular case where the function is increasing, you can see that the left-hand sum is an underestimate, the right-hand sum is an overestimate. Well, that won't be necessarily the, the truth, always the truth, because if the function is decreasing, then we have a role reversal. The left-hand sum becomes the overestimate, and the right-hand sum becomes the underestimate. Okay? What about the midpoint? Well, for the midpoint, let's look at, um, at another picture similar to it, to the previous one. So this is x sub i, x sub i minus 1, x sub i plus 1. The middle, we're going to say the value here will be x bar and x bar. And the index will be i to the left and i plus 1 to the right. OK. okay. <clears throat> so. So x sub i bar will be the average of the one to the left and the one to the right, like so. And the value or the rectangle that will build as a result will be right in the middle and we can see from this uh, image that we have to the left we have an overestimate to the left of the midpoint we have an overestimate and to the right of the midpoint we have an other underestimate actually I shaded too much here I shaded this little em this should supposed to be empty space Okay, because this is the underestimate. So it goes like this. Okay? So you can see that this is a much better estimate because the overestimate and the other estimate kind of compensate each other. Now, uh, do we have overestimate compared to the exact value or uh, underestimate compared to the exact value? Well, this depends on the concavity, really, not on the increase decrease, but the concavity. Okay, as you can see. Uh, so let's see what is the midpoint, m sub n. Well, it's really going to be basically the same structure. We're going to have sigma uh, from one to n, f of x bar sub i the midpoint times delta x, like so. Okay, so uh, we can write the, the midpoint rule. We're going to spell it out this time. I'm going to write it differently. Uh, I'm going to, again, delta x will be equally spaced, so I'm going to put delta x here. And if we break it down, we have f of x sub 1 plus f of x sub 2 plus dot 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 plus f of x sub n. Okay, so this is the rule. The reason I wrote it this way uh, will become evident when I move to the next rule on the next page.